Everyone's here. Hello, everyone. We should be live. Um, please let me know if there's any audio problems. Hold on. I don't think they can hear. Now they should be able to hear you, Jason. Oh, even though you didn't no, say didn't. anything, except Tim's here. Yeah. So, um, we should be good now. Every, every everyone, welcome to the. Geek it's gonna. Chat it's, to gonna it's gonna take me a second because how delayed it is seeing it on Switch, but I'll get there. <laughs> Just listen. That's all you gotta do. Yeah. Um, I need to edit the text because we are currently not Q and A. That's right. Um, just, I'm gonna just write intro here. Ignore my typos. Yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna sit here and drink a beer because that's what I'm doing. It's after five p.m., so I'm having a beer. Uh, I mean, to be fair, <laughs> it's a it's a Wednesday. It's yeah. life, right? I mean, just you're, you're, chill. Yeah, right? you're if you didn't my... have a beer, I'd be worried. Yeah, you're my second webinar of the day too, and and I spent like literally 18 hours on Monday working on that damn CTF. So, yeah, yeah. Connectwise CTF, how is it? So, scale of one to ten, out of the because you're a CTF expert at this point. Yeah, how it's would good. You rate it? It's good. I mean, yeah. on a scale of one to ten, for as far as like the MSP related ones, uh, I mean, it's probably a ten there. Uh, it the content is. I think we are approaching the level where MSPs won't be able to solve them anymore. Uh, we've got, mm -hmm. I'm in third right now because uh, I spent four and a half hours living in a rabbit hole on Monday. Uh, uh, pro tip, reverse engineering Go binaries is terrible. Uh, but like there's only three of us that have everything solved right now. So we're going to, we're going to run into a problem here where I think it's, it's going to be the three of us in a foot race to the end. And I mean, honestly, like if I was to think about a CTF for MSPs, I would phrase it as problem solving, not necessarily yeah. security reverse engineering. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, a bit of both is good. I mean, Kelvin's thing is awesome, right? So you pull some of the like relevant security content into Kelvin's and you've got like this super uber MSP CTF. Maybe I'll ping him and we'll see if we can try to do that a little bit. Yeah, I'd like to, I mean, because MSP Geek sponsored Kelvin's, one of Kelvin's uh, CTFs, and I I think it'd be great to, to do like a community-led CTF. Yeah. Um, you know, where we can pull experts from different areas like security and, you know, help desk and sales and just, here is the MSP CTF 2022. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really, the, as far as like, you know, we're here to talk about the future, as far as like teaching people things i love the format like you can't you can't beat the like hey here's a stack of things for you to solve format that's it's very practical uh if you get good content then it's a great way to teach people skills yeah no, i i fully agree um it's it's a like i i poked around I've, I've done one because uh i just feel like i'd embarrass myself um I'd have to go in there and a pseudonym. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kyle Tegelar. Kyle Cooner. Kyle Tegelar. Kyle Cooner. Yeah. yeah. Kyle Jackson. Go, go Kevin. Kevin Tegelar. Te Kevin Tegelar. 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 Yeah. Tegelar. Yeah. <laughs> you got to do like right. Tegelar. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's it's good. So uh, I think we're I think we're pretty much introed here. We had a nice little fun conversation. So why don't you let our audience know about Jason Slagle? Yeah, so I'm uh, Jason Slegel. I'm the uh, Vice President of Operations at a mid-sized MSP in the Toledo, Ohio area called CWR. Uh, I am, I've been around this community for a couple of years now, although probably only active for about a year and a half, and uh, very relatively active in the security space and telling vendors how and why they suck. So I think I've kind of made a name for myself for being like the village asshole. I'm a lot of swear here, I presume. But your audience is uh, you had to click the thing to get in. Oh, I did have to click the thing. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's mostly just for show. Like, I'm actually a reasonably reasonable and nice guy. It's, uh, but it's effective, right? I'm like, I'm like the, I was thinking about it. I'm like the maven of, uh, maven of MSP people. Like, I'm very opinionated and my defaults tend to be correct, right? And, and I'm very vocal about that. So, <laughs> well, that's, that's a fantastic introduction. Um, <laughs> Um, as our as Zach just said, just what an asshole would say. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. It you you've been around. Um, I think your biggest blow up was back uh, twenty nineteen. 
That's when good. Automate had their issue prior to Automation Nation 2019, the virtual one. No, was that 2020. Yeah. No, that was. It was prior. I don't remember. It was 2020 because it was virtual. Year, it was last year. A year's year. gone. Yeah. yeah. I, like a year yeah. is like. I've added a year when I should just yeah. take a year and just throw it away. Um, but so we're here to discuss the future of the MSP world. Um, as I've done previously with these these casts, um, they're conversational in nature. We have a couple of topics we're going to hit on. Um, I invited Jason specifically because of his experience in the security sector, um, his interactions with vendors, and his uh, you know his MSP experience. Obviously, that's first and foremost. Um, and it's uh, the the goal of these is to help educate everyone and prepare them for where this is going because. There are plenty of paths to take forward, but generally speaking, there's really only one future in the MSP world, and we need to be prepared for it. Um, so, without further ado, let me click my button, um, aka open my Word document. So, security is an increasingly larger area of focus for MSPs as of late, correct? Would that be a correct I mean, statement? Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. Um, I know my personal experiences with dealing with security and trying to educate clients and trying to get them to buy in to security. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult process. Like it, you know, we think it should just be turn it on, but it's also not our money. So our MSP is working towards making sure our clients are more secured. Um, how do you feel the current security landscape is as far as MSPs and vendors go um, with the increase to uh, increase of threats to the entire ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it it's a tough question, right? It's a tough problem because the definition of an MSP, it really, it really runs the gamut, right? Uh, we've got, you know, the little one man shops all the way up to, I mean, I think you guys are pretty large, right? And the company's even larger than you guys and, and security adoption, uh, it, it really varies uh, across that. Like we have uh, in our, in our general small little regional area, we have a, a, an MSP that's, bought another MSP. They're from out of town and they're considerably larger than us. And I just came across one of their quotes and it's like, everything security is optional. And I think we're getting to a, a, a spot in the general industry where that's going to come back and haunt us, right? Because the longer we spend uh, allowing security to be optional, the more you start to see breaches, those breaches hit the news cycle, right? And the, and the general confidence in the MSP community slowly erodes away. Uh, and I, I think that's the biggest fear I have is that uh, you start to have conversations with clients. It already happens. We had an MSP that had like an MSP wide breach here in Toledo and uh, it, they, it was a bunch of stuff they didn't have patched and uh, a bunch of their stuff got whacked. And, you go and you talk to a client once that happens and they're like, no, I saw on the news that like, you know, MSPs keep getting hacked and it's like, I just don't want to deal with an MSP. And it's like, well, man, that's terrible because one, I promise you the shittiest MSP is probably going to do it better than you're going to do it yourself. But secondly, we're not all painted with the same brush. Right. And, and, and so maybe you need to stop being so price conscious and realize that, you know, these things, they, they exist, whether or not an MSP is helping you, right. The MSP didn't necessarily, in this case they did, uh, but they didn't necessarily cause you to directly get breached because if they weren't there, you also wouldn't have been patching that stuff and you probably would have gotten breached anyway. Yeah. And there are potential issues too, because, depending on the problem that goes back to vendors like if if they get through let's say like going back to kaseya if, if they go through kaseya and an msp gets compromised utilizing kaseya it's not msp is compromised it's because yeah. it's kaseya led breach <laughs> it's so yeah. that's also <laughs> a potential problem because sensationalized headlines and that gets yeah. more people involved even though it's you know, someone left their 2FA off or, you know, yeah. didn't have their own personal security stuff. So there's, you know, there's, it, it's, it's another side of that coin that not everyone thinks about. 
Yeah, no, I mean, that's for sure a thing, right? And and we're still, based on the last analysis uh, I've done with it, uh, I something like more than 80 to 85% of breaches uh, of MSPs are basically credential misuse, right? So it's like somebody had an account that didn't have MFA on that allowed you to get into some random tool in your stack that uh, can be used to either directly crypto or, you know, you basically laterally move once you're in and you eventually get to something that can run commands on the entire client base and it's not in Kaseya's case like the Kaseya breach that that's Kaseya's fault right yeah, like it, it, you could do everything right and you could still get breached right but in the case of uh you know an MSP that gets whacked because the third party knock they used didn't have MFA on the account because they shared one account for the knock and that password got breached and somebody logged in and did it. The vendor's not at fault, right? Like the, the MSP at that case is clearly at fault. Yeah. And I, and I think it eventually comes to that, but the initial headlines are always the most yeah. important. Um, yep. To answer Ray's question, uh, do you think MSPs have destroyed the name MSP? Maybe it's time to differentiate. Uh, I don't think so. Because regardless of what we call ourselves, MSPs, TSPs, MSSs, SSPs, um, they're going to be bad bad, pe bad actors, you know, who are just not as good as they should be. Um, so we can call ourselves uh, superheroes and put, you know, super in front of all of our tool set, like Fortinet does. And then... It, someone's gonna be like, I'm a superhero too, but I'm a one man shop and I don't, I can afford to buy yeah. these cool tools. So here's my band aid solution that may or may not work. So, and I've been in this industry a long time, and you know, back in the like er, late 2000 or early 2000s, late 90s, uh, we were an ISP and we kind of we went out and I for the first time ran into something that is what I would call there was a break fix shop right and i'm dealing with this lady and she's trying to fix this like shitty ass like nt40 or windows 2000 problem and like i immediately i knew how to fix it right but this lady sat there and bumbled and fucked that round on the sink for like three hours and in in at 110 120 whatever the blur rate was back then and i had a revelation then that consulting at least in the hourly world you don't have to necessarily be the smartest person in the world. You just have to be smart enough to convince your client that you know better than they do. And there are a lot of MSPs that I feel like, you know, you've got like a level, strong level one, you know, weak level two uh, guy that he's like, man, this sucks. Like I could totally be my own business. He's got a little bit of business sense. And now he goes out and he's an MSP and he doesn't understand security. He doesn't understand uh the the deeper piece of this and you know he's the guy at the end that's not going to get it that's going to get his tool set crypto because he doesn't understand security you know I, I you know you had drew on last time right mm -hmm. and so i don't want to paint all one-man shops with the same brush but it is definitely as somebody that hangs out in these various facebook groups of msps it is very prevalent people yeah. that just don't seem to know what they're doing that call themselves msps and they're the ones ruining the name yeah and it it I mean there's there's shops that are twenty man shops that are that don't also understand security. So it, yep. Well, it's a hundred percent more prevalent for the lower count individual MSPs. It's it's not a like it's not a there, there's there's plenty of examples of bigger MSPs that still don't follow up the best security practices, right? Oh, tons of them. Yep. All right. I mean, so. I mean, I can elaborate there, like even in town here, that one that bought, right, like that came in, it's like they're still like they're not even including backups in their in their core product offering. Right. It's like how it's like this is 2021 and backups are an add on service not included in your all you can eat package. Like, seriously, like what the I, I just don't get it. Yeah, it's it's in it, it's it's an interesting thought exercise to go into MSPs and just evaluate how they do things compared to your best standard. Because obviously while everyone strives to have the best and do the best and, and make sure that everything they do in their company and their businesses is the best, it doesn't always turn out that way. So 
but you also have in mind what it would be like. So being able to yeah. just to go in and just like almost like car shopping, you know, you're looking at the cool new vehicles, you're looking at it, seeing what, you know, is around what you think is a great car, but you know, you have may, maybe you don't like it. Maybe it's something different, but it's just nice to, to, to look and see how other things, cause there's also a massive learning experience with that as well. Um, being able to identify things that they do that you don't do that you should do. <laughs> yeah. It's always fun. I mean, yeah, for sure. It's, it's, I don't know. That's an interesting world that, you know, just because the, the provider doesn't do it doesn't mean it's not relevant and not necessary. Right. Like in, mm -hmm. in, you know, Darren MM just pointed out like security is a huge differentiator. Right. Like, and that's a hundred percent the case that, right. Like I can win deals. I can wedge myself uh, in, into all of those quotes and contracts by, you know, laying down like, Hey, here's what we're doing security wise. Here's what they're doing. Right. But there, there's some amount of customers that like literally price is the only differentiator. And so you have to be comfortable with the fact that you're not going to get all of them. Right. You, you're going to lose you know, 80 percent of your deals or 60 percent of your deals or whatever that number is. Uh, some of it, you know, is you got to work on showing your value. But some of it's just because no matter what you do, the client isn't gonna, they just don't care about the risk. Right. And, and if it, honestly, it, where I've landed in my world right now, if the client doesn't care about the risk, I don't want them. Right. Like, I just don't want the client because it's a huge red flag. <laughs> yeah. When, when they get breached, right. They're going to be out there telling everyone else how much we suck. And it, the last thing I want is an angry client out there telling, you know, uh, Kelvin made the bad marriage analogy. The last thing I want is a client that's now a bad marriage because they went and got breached because they chose not to buy security. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's true. I mean, but it does, it's also a maturity level for the MSP to be able to say yeah. that kind of stuff. And not a lot of MSPs are that mature. Like it, there's, there's a, a long list of things that I would qualify you as a mature MSP. And yeah. there are specific things that even our MSP doesn't do as well as it could. You know what I mean? I mean, we all have that. Yeah, everyone has that, right? It's like, yeah, it's, it, it's imposter disorder is a real thing. You know, it's, yeah. It, it, if you any of it, you're better than a, a good portion of your peers. And it doesn't, you don't have to climb up very high up that security ladder to be like in the best 10% of MSPs out there. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, Kel Kelvin's company is, is what I would call a unicorn company. You know, he doesn't consider himself a unicorn. Um, Kelvin's a unicorn. Yes, he is. Uh, so Kevin is a unicorn. Kevin. Uh, Ke <laughs> Kevin. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, that's what you should be working towards as a, as an internal company. Um, and when you yeah. get to that level, then you can start doing cool stuff. But, uh, I think we've hit this, we, we've kind of ventured off a little bit, um, on this, um, so another huge thing that's impacting MSPs or is like on the verge of impacting MSPs is governmental regulations. Um, and I know that there's nothing specific um, on the horizon. Like you have CMMC, you have the yeah. Louisiana passing laws that affect MSPs. What do you think regulation looks like in the future do you think we're going to have it do you think that we're going to uh be able to influence that any do you think us because i know there's a, a standard um i forget who's setting it up um who's trying to push regulation Pearl. yeah who's trying to push regulation on msps from the msp side um yeah do you what, what are your thoughts on that so uh First of all, I, I will say publicly, I think uh, CMMC is now what we should all be targeting at for a variety of reasons. But uh, yeah, Carl Palachuk uh, is spun up, uh, what is it, the National Society for IT Service Providers, I think is what it is actually called. Uh, it's attempting to be an industry alliance group. Uh, full disclosure, I unsuccessfully attempted to get on the board uh, of it. Uh, and... I think they're they're trying to 
guide what regulation looks like. And I, I actually honestly think that's the right strategy because I think the days the ship has sailed on the fact that we're not going to get regulated uh, because somebody is doing a really good job of convincing the government that MSPs are to blame for everything wrong in the world. And, and you know, in some cases we probably are right. Uh, but if, if we can't show that as a body uh, we can get our shit together and figure out what's going on and, and elevate the general security awareness of the MSP space, then the government's going to come in and they're going to do it for us. Uh, and so at this point, the best thing I think we can hope for is to guide some of those regulations and, and make them not look like uh, CMMC, right? Because I think that CMMC, it, I feel very strongly about some of those CMMC-like things where they're not prescriptive enough for most MSPs. Like it's like a bunch of like old long haired dudes just went into like a room and smoked a bunch of pot and came out with these like edicts of things that you should do. And like, none of them are super achievable. Like it's really hard to measure yourself, whether or not you're actually successful against them. Right. Like it's, it's just, it's a set of ideals without any concrete like guidance as to what those what's, ideals what's actually X, look like in X, practice. XCKD where it's like, we have 15 different standards. We should make yeah. a standard to come along with them. Now we have 15 competing standards. <clears throat> have, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. It's that's my favorite XKCD comic ever. It's number 927, which I happen to know off the top of my head because it's my favorite. Uh, it, it's it. I yeah. I just think that you know we as a community need to rally around like a, a set of standards. And I'm struggling. You know, I know you and I both sit on you know, different boards and the CompTIA ISO. And my hope was, and still kind of a little bit is that we can start to try to get maybe the ISO to drive some of that. Uh, I know ASCII has an initiative too, a security initiative. I'm on the, I'm on the guidance council of that too. Uh, but something has to happen and and it needs to be one thing, right? Like you've got all these industry groups. And so now we've got Carl saying, we've got the ISO, we've got ASCII doing something. Uh, I got asked in the past two months, I think I've got asked about two others. The only thing worse than uh, having no guidance as to what we should be doing standard wise standards wise is having five different guidances for what should we should be doing standards wise well at that point you have like step <clears throat> someone steps in and been like you yeah. have, like with hipaa i mean that that's if you're medical you're hipaa if you're if yeah. you do financial data you're pci and that's what it's going to then the government's going to pick or make their own and have the yeah. six competing standard well, <clears throat> if the government picks it's going to either be some variation of cmmc or it's going to be like nist 871 right like uh it's going to be one of those or uh it's going to be is it 871 i stupid numbers are always going to mixed up in my head i think it's 871 uh it's going to be one of those uh variants that we end up trying to all model to and they're they're not prescriptive enough for the average MSP. So what is an MSP you end up doing is choosing something like CIS that gives you some like concrete guidance. And then you try to basically map that to the compliance framework that you're forced to use. But it don't, I don't think it has to go that far, right? Like I think as an industry, we can set a base level of cyber hygiene, right? Like in in say that hey, we all need to be doing this, and and we all need to be doing this for ourselves before we're telling our, before we're doing it for our clients, right? So, you know, if, if not every single account in your PSA or any tool that can run, any tool that runs uh, <clears throat> agents on your, on your systems as the system user, uh, if, if you don't have multi-factor in every one of those accounts or every one of those systems, man, you're totally doing it wrong. Uh, and then, you know, if we can push together a set of standards saying like, hey, as an industry, uh, we're doing these sorts of things. And we feel very strongly that uh, from a regulation standpoint, if we're going to uh, if we're going to regulate, we should target these things and we get local activism. Right. Because these aren't <clears throat> we will see regulation and I would guess. 20 to 25 states before we see any indication that we're going to see something at the federal level. That's just how these things work, 
right? So we need people active at the state and local go, uh, levels to basically guide what that regulation looks like uh, and, and solidify around how we want that to work so that it, it works out in a way that's achievable for us. Because if it doesn't, uh, the small shops are, and, and depending on your size, you may be this is a good or a bad thing. It's going to push the small shops out because they're not going to be able to afford uh, to compete there, right? They're not going to be yeah, able no. to afford to do all the things necessary. I mean, if <clears throat> it's what, $150,000 to $200,000 to get, you know, CMMC certified, like if you're a one man shop, that's two years revenue. There's no way, there's no way you're going to be doing that, right? So, you know, we need to make sure that uh, we raise the standards that all of our clients are, are or all of our MSPs are doing and in, in set the regulation to an achievable level. I so, feel like. um, ignoring anything we've discussed in the past prior to this call, uh, do you think that having... So HIPAA is all about identifying where you were breached having measures in place to help prevent breaches and being able to log that a breach occurred, right? It's those primary things that, that is in policies and procedures to, you know, handle all of that. Right. Um, yeah. so do, that's, that it's, it's not, you have to implement a, a soccer cell. It's, you have to log your network traffic and you have to log this in a sock and sim allow that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So going off that standard, because that is as a government standard, um, do you think something like that for MSPs could work? Like uh, you need to, because yeah. log your information, understand where you could be breached at, stuff like that. So the problem again, in, yeah, man, it's, it's really, this is tough because is. the problem with something like HIPAA is that it's very easy to cheat essentially and say, well, man, I back up all my event logs everywhere, somewhere centrally, right? Like, and so I've totally met the centralized law collection piece of it. And, and then the letter of the law, you will in, and because there's no, uh, there's no guiding principles as to what's acceptable. As long as you can in good faith show that you were backing up your logs to a central location, for instance, you're going to pass that measure. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, no one is going to check it. Uh, no one is going to check to make sure that you actually did it until you get a breach, right? So it uh, it's it's really difficult, I, th I think, to go down that road. But at the same time, I think we need to do something. So I am very uh, I'm very forward with the fact that I think you should say. You have to have MFA, right? Like I think at the MSP level, maybe not the individual client levels, MSPs need CM at the very least, right? Like your tools need centralized logging or some sort of centralized place to collect it. Uh, whether or not you rise to the level of needing a SOC as an MSP, uh, I think that's gonna tie into a topic we cover here shortly. Uh, I think that prices out a lot of the smaller things, right? Because those, uh, I sat on a webinar earlier this year and somebody said there's like 400,000 unfilled cybersecurity jobs, right? So where are MSPs gonna, where are the 200,000 MSPs gonna come up with SOC resources? Uh, they're just, they're not, they're just gonna trust the vendor that is selling them like a piece of shit software and calling it a SOC, uh, right? So, so let me you ask know, you maybe, let me, yeah, so go. if, if, if like a HIPAA type guide wouldn't be effective, which I don't think it would be because I mean, I think it would provide assistance. I don't think it'd be a good guide to follow a regulation for an MSP on. Um, what if there was a checklist of things that you had to do to achieve like a bronze, silver, gold standard, yeah. like MFA yeah. is a bronze level thing. Uh, so Being actually, understanding yeah. of your vendor tool set and how it works, bronze level, silver level, or whatever. Yeah. So, so when I said earlier that I thought ISO could actually do this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have Trustmark, right? They have their whole, like, the, the CompTIA has got their whole, like, certification thing, and they have actually a, a security uh, thing, whether or not we, we think it's just a money grab or anyone thinks it's just a money grab. It, it exists already, right? Like, in... Texas, 
you can't call yourself an engineer unless you have a PE degree, right? Like I well, you have actually, to have a, a stamp or something. Yeah, right? well, I well, yeah, you have to take the PE. Uh, I am actually an engineer. Like I have that ring there is like the order of engineer ring. So I, I graduated from an engineering school uh, and so feel comfortable calling myself an engineer, right? So I think Darren in the chat just said it, like, do we regulate uh, what it takes to call yourself, you know, whatever we decide calling an MSP is that you have to meet a minimum set of standards and show uh, a minimal level of uh, basically approval or certification to do it. My wife's a pharmacist, right? You can't call yourself a pharmacist without uh, essentially going through X amount of school and then passing a licensing exam, right? So, <clears throat> At some point, do we require a licensing exam for people that are are doing this sort of stuff? And I, I think that's a question, right? That's I a think tough question because then yeah. you have like is that the business owner is it renewable? Do you have to have the yeah. techs take their own license exam to work for that company? Like, is uh, that, I think that's a rabbit hole that's not considering uh, I, the size of MSPs and the level of which some of these. I don't know if that's a something that is doable in the short it, term but it's really interesting right so during the pandemic i read the like 1918 great influenza book right and, and if you look back in those days there was a huge push over uh what you could actually you had to do to call yourself a doctor or a nurse right so like these these aren't challenges that are unique to our industry like over the entire history of civilization when we get these uh these practices that are essentially responsible for the well-being of other people or things in one way or another there we go through a time period where we have to decide as a society if we want to hold that group of people to a minimal level of standards and i think as msps we're probably approaching that point yeah i mean like it, it i think it'd be something that would be its own discussion point would like a licensing exam um like it's there there'd have to be levels to it just because of the way the MSPs operate like hey, because I agree. The, the traditional engineer apprentice setup could work if that was how MSPs are structured but they're not you have so many different variations of levels they so have project engineers security engineers help desk engineers and different levels inside those pockets well, if you compare it to the medical field, though, it's no different, right? Even if you compare it to the engineering field, right? Like, I have a degree in computer engineering, right? Like, but, like, that doesn't qualify me to build bridges, right? Like, I specialize inside of my field, and, and that's what I do, right? So, I think inside of the computer science or computer engineering industry, we can also have specialization. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's really tough as somebody that... It, has owned like a stack of certifications in my life and, and realized oh, that useless. almost all of them are useless, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, in, in watching the ITT techs of the world, I presume that's a national chain, basically They're push gone. people They're down gone. these roads. ITT I know they are, yeah. uh, but push people down the road of, you can have an $80,000 a year career. If you go get your CCNA, right. It's, it's really difficult to, to combat that right because you'll just you'll get this giant money money rush by these for-profit colleges to just basically certify a bunch of people teach them to the test and without some sort of like applicable super practical exam then we don't then we basically just kick the can down the road another couple of years and so we churn out a bunch of paper certified people that don't actually know anything anyways true um but like some of those, like CCNP and whatnot, those are almost licenses. To, well, they used to be. I don't, I'm not too familiar with the networking now, but they are licenses to print money um, because they're in high demand jobs and they're, you generally have to have those certifications to work on that high end equipment, yeah. specifically for Cisco. But it's not the end all be all. And you could move your way into doing that type of work if you were skilled enough and you worked hard. Um, but most certifications are just, I, I want to specify the information you gain in a certification can be useful in a normal job. The fact that you took a test and passed it doesn't necessarily mean that you're good in that area. 
in most cases, the certification exam only shows that you were good at a test. Uh, I, I mean, I let my CCMP and my CCDP expire. I still hold my VCP. I hold, I'm a dual VCP and I hold my RHC. Of those ones I've listed, the only one that I feel proud of is the RHC because it's practical, right? Like you didn't just sit down and take like an 80 question exam, right? You sat down and they gave you 10 objectives that you had eight hours to complete on the machine and you had to do them and they had to work when you were done uh, to pass, right? Now, are there cheap, easy guides that can help you through that a little bit? Yeah, probably. I mean, there's brain dumps, but there's definitely a base level of understanding required to do that, right? And so, I mean, full disclosure, I labbed the CCIE route switch three times and, and failed it three times because it's fucking hard, right? And, and so I think there are levels of... Uh, of certification you can get there right like what if we took something like kelvin ctf and we turned that into a certification exam where now you're using like real actual pre uh, practicable things that you have to do and it's not just a question pool you have to memorize right because i'm a ham radio operator because i memorize the question pool right but that doesn't actually qualify me to be really good at radio yeah, but so being able to solve Ke kelvin ctf like a something. hybrid setup like you It'd be like, so we're getting way off topic. Um, so, but it's a fun conversation. S let's, let's imagine not saying this is anything remotely, but just for the simplicity's sake, MSP geek gold standard, you get, you have to pass a specific subset of things for your MSP. Like you have to have MFA on all your accounts. You have to subscribe mm -hmm. to a Sox sim. You have to understand your bit of tool set. You have to understand the supply chain. All, you know, all that good stuff. Boom, we have a list to gold check mark. But then you also have to have your engineers score X number of points on a CTF in a time period. That gets you your your certification and your standard. Yeah. Um, do you think something like that would be beneficial? Like, as a as a as at least a starting point for regulation? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think if you're going to go down the road, and you're going to do something like that. We have to start with uh, a base level certification, but there has to be a continuing education component of it, too. Right. So I'm I'm actually in favor of something like that, where you have to score so many points on whatever practical exam we we do. But you should also have to continue to show that that knowledge is current. Right. Because uh, the world especially the security world, it's literally changing by the week, right? So, like, what is applicable today may not be applicable tomorrow. I, I caught, yeah. And, but you also, so in my experience, you have the, here's what I did to pass the test. Here's the information that they're going to do. Yeah. And there's ways to combat that. But it, again, there's only so much you can do to prevent that. Um, so yeah. there's, there's a lot of problems to solve in this, and I'm not sure that we can solve them in this one poem, in this already over topic. Um, <laughs> I... But uh, yes, Ray, your cert from 2003 is current. Um, it was I mean, probably yeah. on something useful like uh, yeah, he was Nobel a CCA Network. voice. No, he's a CCA voice, man. Yeah. Um, and for the record, Martin. Uh, I just leaned forward. See, this is my normal sitting position. I just leaned forward because I got serious. All right. So I think but, it's time that we move on from regulation because we'll be here probably all night. Um, so I think this, this is actually a good transition point. In the current day and age, we have managed service providers, managed security service providers, technical service providers, probably a thousand other names. Do you think MSPs should pivot into being MSSPs? Or do you think MSPs already act as MSSPs? Or do you think it's all a bunch of random words that make no sense whatsoever? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I sat in the security channel on MSP Geek yesterday, and I was arguing with somebody over what the term SOC meant, right? So, I mean, in the end, where I've kind of internally in my mind drawn the line is we consider ourselves an MSSP or an MSP, right? Not an MSSP. And the reason that I consider myself an MS, MSP instead of an MSSP is I do not employ a SOC, right? I do not right now have security analysts. I do not have people in, in hand. Uh, I, I outsource that right now, right? So, so in the end, I consider myself an MSP because of that. I don't know 
that I mean, Ray's Ray's making a great point there, right? It's like the the S, right? Oh, I'm a managed security solution provider. You know what? I've talked to a lot of those people. They're just as dumb as all the half the other MSPs I talk to. They don't know what the hell they're doing. And you know the the fact that they added their extra S to their the name just means that like the, oh now they're going into clients instead of saying they're an MSSP or an MSP they're going to go in there when you already have an MSP they're going to they're going into your clients and they're going oh no we're not an MSP I'm a managed like service security provider or whatever the hell MSSP actually stands for and now they're and now their person's actually willing to have a conversation because my little bit of salesy stuff I do, which isn't a lot because I'm a nerd, uh, indicates that as soon as you mention security or risk, business owners will talk to you no matter what the case is, right? So, so to me, it's basically a sales and marketing tool. That extra S, somehow S's are powerful, and that extra S is, is giving you like some sales and marketing clout. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, sure, everyone pivots to MSSP, and we'll just ruin that name too. Done. Um, MSSP go. geek. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I mean, it's that was a quick topic. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, that, that's it. Is at the end of the day, you're a managed services provider. You just yeah. specialize in security. I'm a technology partner. It doesn't. It, none of this fucking they're, matters. They're, they're like acronyms. I'm here to make your business work words. better, so that you don't have to worry about it, right? Like that. That is like that's our like one liner, right? Like basically to manage your technology so you can have business peace of mind and not give two shits about technology. It's, yeah, that's, I, I mean, butchered it, but yeah, it, it is. It is. But like I, I mean, it, it just like when. Like I think it was in 2018, 2019 when the word then TSP started to pop up. You know, we're a technical service provider or technology service provider. That you you still provide serve you're managing yeah. their equipment and services. You're not just selling them stuff. Like that's it's the same thing. You're just putting a new name on it to try to get the bad taste of the MSP out of your mouth or your clients' mouth. And they're going to yeah. still understand you're an MSP. Like yeah. they're they're not dumb. <laughs> You may get it. They may make bad decisions when it comes to buying things occasionally, but your clients aren't dumb. I mean, um, isn't Facebook rebranding to get away from bad, bad like vibes? No, they're not. Oh, okay. They're selling themselves to a new company. <laughs> okay. Like Google did with Alphabet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I, we call ourselves technology like business partners when we're talking to people, but like, dude, we say MSP, like, because that's what people know. That's the term they understand, right? Mm -hmm. So why would you, like, literally, why would you call yourself any different? Because as you pointed out, they're going to know what the hell you do, anyways, right? Like, if you don't do security, right? Like, if you, oh, I'm not an MSSP because I don't have a SOC and I don't do security, right? There, and there points out he's got pen testers, right? Like, in the end, right, if you're not doing the security space, if you're not doing that, then I'm going to come in and I'm going to do it anyways. And, you know, I'm still going to call myself an MSP, but I'm going to take advantage of the fact that I ha I sell a service you guys don't. And that is that is totally a way for me to get my foot in the door, and eventually I'm going to displace you. Yeah. And not only that, but as an MSP, if I don't have someone do those services, I will partner with a vendor that will. Yeah. That will yep. allow me to... to support those services without actually having to pay to support those services it's it like it it's a dumb thing and i think it's going to eventually die yeah I, I mean i in the end so if you so say you're an msp and you don't understand the security stuff what i will say is that i'm a huge fan of partnering with somebody that understands it as long as they actually understand it yeah. right so and you need to understand it enough to realize that you're not just getting sold because there's a lot of companies in our space. So, oh my God, I went to the ASCII event and so many of them called me and it was like, it's like fucking cringeworthy. So many of these vendors called me and they're like, we got all the solutions to all your problems. And I have a five minute conversation with somebody that actually does security and they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're just better at sales and marketing than you are. Right. Yeah. So uh, if, if you don't understand how to do it, you should totally partner with somebody that does. I can't off the top of my head give super recommendations on who that is. But I mean, they're out there. If you pin me down later, maybe I can try to find some because we don't. I just do most of it myself. Yeah, I just do most of it myself. I'm just going to dedicate my entire life to doing anything I want. To yeah. Do. How many boards do you sit on again? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to convince myself to not run for school board in my local town. See, you're just you're adding another board. Like, yeah, 
for you now. Um, so, moving on to a topic that I'm going to enjoy very, very much. Um, because it's something that is in the forefront of everyone's mind, but it's not completely there. Like, everyone real like you don't realize it's there but it, it's totally there um let me just type because i can't think and type at the same time there we go i'm gonna add an s to that but, okay so msp vendors in the supply chain so as an msp obviously i didn't write an arm and told myself I didn't write a PSA myself. I have vendors who have vendors who utilize vendors. And my MSP who, who utilize subtle ruins. Yeah. <laughs> um, has to come from somewhere. And my skill set and my team's skill set allow me to service my clients, but the tool set allows me to shine, right? So regardless of feature sets regardless of anything of competingness like right the vendor space is rapidly changing and there some vendors are more prepared for the future than others how do you think vendors are preparing themselves for the future and do you think there's an issue to worry about yeah uh, so yeah, I don't know if my giant sigh came through there, right? So so like obviously this topic is probably the biggest area where like people actually know who the hell I am because right like it's it's an area I'm very passionate about and and very outspoken about, uh, <clears throat> and it's an area that is showing signs of getting a little better, but man, it's still probably a little ways off. I. I spoke at IT Nation Secure about the insecurity of our MSP vendors. Uh, I challenged directly uh, the vendors to come back to me. And I, they were there. There were a bunch of vendors there. A bunch of vendors saw the talk with what they were doing security-wise. Uh, a handful did. I think Ray had a conversation with me after it, right, because he's, he's awesome. Uh, Datto, Ryan Weeks, and I had a really long conversation. Uh, I know what ConnectWise is doing. Uh, but generally you know we have a, a huge problem in our space right now like i'm, I'm going to pick on something that just recently happened and uh I'm probably i'm gonna piss a vendor off probably by doing it you know fucking crew who right like crew who just had a thing where uh their back-end web app was basically dishing out uh the integration logins to whatever platform you were integrating with in an xhr response on their web page so like literally anytime you opened a survey uh you could uh see the integration login including the url username and password required to log into the person's rmm as the uh as a crew account right and and, and so the vendor nightmare scenario yeah, holy shit, man. The vent, it's a PSA. It's not R RMM would be a nightmare scenario, right? But yeah, but you can uh, get in access to the PSA yeah. and that has an RMM integration. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, maybe it's like DEF CON like three instead of DEF CON four. It, I mean, it's still this is this is a relatively big deal, right? And 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 so the vendor. Right. Rather than being transparent and, you know, publishing like a blog post and shit about it. Right. Like they they send out individual emails to affect their partners and basically minimize the problem. Right. And, and like this is like a prime example of everything wrong with our space. Uh, we've got uh, of the big four. Right. Like uh, uh I don't know if Darren was calling me a Ryan Weeks fanboy or if he was saying he was a Ryan Weeks fanboy. Ryan Weeks is awesome. Like he's doing great things. He's very transparent. He's out there. Uh, ConnectWise has, you know, Wes, uh, who for some fucking reason I can't understand isn't actually CISO of ConnectWise. That's the biggest fucking mistake well, you're is. making right now. He is a CISO. Uh, yeah, okay. External CISO, whatever the hell that means. That's, that's uh, a fair question. Yeah. Let me know if you find the answer. Because I'm also curious. 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I mean, so you've got this like huge outspoken guy that's also very active in the community space, right? Mm-hmm. So so we've got two vendors that I legitimately think, for better or worse, or how whatever you think of their like shitty ass group of uh, 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 VB nonsense, whatever you think of that, right? They're trying and they're and they're making an effort to get better, right? But then you've got the Kaseas of the world that not only aren't responding to anything they aren't doing anything they're like actively like pseudo hostile towards uh researchers looking at them right and then you've got like the end centrals of the world that i just have their fucking heads in the sand and they're just like they're just pretending there's no problems here uh i mean and those are the big vendors on the small vendors you know you range from somebody like crew right like you know that you know, they're just, they're just trying, they didn't make it, they, they made a dumb mistake. This wasn't a huge deal, right? This, it, it, I mean, it was, it was a huge, it's a giant ass deal, but it was an honest mistake, right? They, they, to, to reveal a little more information that we, I was able in a little bit of research to discover, right? They're MongoDB on the back end, right? And I mean, regardless of the fact that one of my underlying principles is friends don't let friends use Mago. Uh, if you have a MongoDB and you serialize the document, you get child documents like for free. And, and it was just a case of something like that happening. And that's an honest mistake. Uh, but a lot of these vendors, they're rushing to market because the EBITDA multipliers in our space are giant right now, right? So it's, it's a race to get revenue to sell. And, and as long as it's going to be a race to get revenue to sell, uh, I had a slide in my ITNS talk that like it was kind of riffing on the micro thing. It's like security third, right? They don't give a shit about security. Security is like it's a thing they do at the end. And I think that we need to change that. And security needs to be a primary focus of these tools, especially if they're running an agent. That's that, you know, and that's that's true. But I, I so we all know ConnectWise is making strides in that area like that as a concerned connectwise user they have lacked now they've made strides previously but they have lacked the the gung-ho that's really needed there and i think they've turned that around they just have a mountain to climb to get to where they need to be but they're on that track right would you agree with that I think they're trying. I mean, <clears throat> uh, so compare it to a year ago, essentially, when I busted into their social hour at ITNE and said I had a zero day, uh, they, you know, they came through and they fixed Jesse's SQL I, SQL injection, uh, Jesse Connor. They fixed his SQL injection and, and left 35 or 38 other SQL injections in the same source file there. Right. Like I sent them mine then and I'm like, hey, I got like 10 more in this file, but I'm only sending you one. So go fix the rest of them in the file. And honestly, I think they did a pretty reasonable job. There's I think there's still probably some things with a ton of work I could poke at there, but it pays me. I'm going to make the joke again, Kyle Jackson. I'm sorry. It pays me better to work on the CTFs than that. Uh, I, I think they're I think they are they understand the gravity of the situation uh, with regards to their tool set and understand that the quickest way for them to lose market share and to piss off their corporate overlords is to have a MS like a tool level breach and, and are acting accordingly. So we, we talked about Datto and Ryan Weeks. Um, I've had the pleasure of listening to him speak. He's a very intelligent individual and he knows what he's doing. Um, I haven't used Datto. So it's hard for me to personally say um, how good their security system, not really a system, more of their security posture, I guess. Um, I know Ryan is super into making sure everything is secure. And I know that he, you know, but they're they're a cloud application, whereas Automate doesn't always have that option. You know, the architecture is 100% different. Um, But I do know that, would you agree that Datto's security posture is probably the market lead. Yeah, I a hundred percent. They the only thing, literally the only thing I've beat Ryan up for is the fact that they don't have a published bug bounty schedule. And uh, he has flat out told me that he's just waiting on budgeting approval, right? Because he doesn't want to publish something and not be able to pay it. Uh, so he's waiting on that. But they are actively paying bounties. 
they have a very their their VDP is amazing. Like it's very well thought out. It's very well written. They've got a very good disclosure process. They allow the publishers to re- to to publish their research, uh, and they actively seem to be. Uh, yeah. Uh, attempting to make their product better, right? Like even even responding to you know the whole thing with uh, Dato Arm. There's like a discovery vulnerability as far as somebody actually somebody released it pretty recently. You can you can look, do DNS lookups and basically find a bunch of the Dato like appliances out on the internet, uh, and they even respond to things like that, right? And 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 so I think as a vendor in our space they are doing the best job of uh leading the pack security wise because i think they know if they don't right they're public they're the only one that's public so they'll they're the only ones that i think directly uh are going to get beat by shareholders if the msp space fails and i think they're acting accordingly um and there, yeah, there's other vendors you have like ninja and halo and the synchros of the world um, are you familiar with any of their security stances? I, I, you know, honestly, like I have a good relationship with several of the people at Ninja. Uh, I in in feel like I could take them security things, and and they they would look at them. Uh, they unfortunately or fortunately, depending on which side of the fence you're on, have a small enough market share that I don't think they're a very big target yet. Uh, and and so. Uh, I it's been less of a big deal to uh, to, to look at those. Uh, eventually, you know, I when I spoke at Gurkhan in mid September uh, in front of a room with 250 security researchers, I basically encouraged them uh, to you know security research our MSP tool change, and that I as the village asshole of the MSP would do my damnedest to make sure that we're actually going to pay bounties and stuff. And, and so I'm focusing my effort there to try to make sure that, you know, we can get these independent third party security researchers uh, paid <clears throat> to find vulnerabilities in our tool. Cause that benefits everybody. And, and so when that happens, there'll be enough bandwidth, I think, and enough, uh, enough people eyeballing this to start looking at the people like Ninja. So, being, uh, I'm going to say this, a security expert, how do you personally verify your vendor security posture and stance and that they're a good fit for your company? Uh, <laughs> as well as I can. Well, not, uh, yeah, but do you have like, yeah. there a sheet? Do you follow something that you can... Wait. We ask Check some against. questions. Yeah, it, it's like I have some questions I tend to ask them. Some of them ask you just released uh, uh, their security vendors shit there. Uh, that was I had a non zero amount of input on that. Uh, I don't tend to ironically enough, I don't tend to ask them about their data uh, practices. And honestly, if they don't have a super big tie into like the PSA in that, I probably do not as good of a job as I should. Uh, but if they run an agent as system, right, I, I will do at least a cursory look at their product. I, I will do at least a little bit of a scan and I'm, at, and I'm at least asking them a question, some questions about it, right? Like I've, I've had conversations, like we run Ovic, right? I've had conversations about Ovic, about the Ovic agent and some of the things they do. I've had conversations with the Lion Guard about their agent and some of the things they do. Uh, so I, I, I do try to do a little bit of research, uh, but the, at the end of the day, I don't, I don't have time to third party security scan everything. So a lot of it's just me asking questions and just being, uh, okay with the answers, right? Like there's, there's no easy way for me to third party verify them. How dare you? Yeah, I know. I thought I was going to have like this amazing sheet or you just be like, I just pen test every vendor. I I wish I had I need to, some sort of magic device to make more hours in the day because man I love I love hacking at shit. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> but leave my stuff alone, please. Um, yeah. So don't, don't don't run three Voight products. I don't. Um, moving on. Uh, so where obviously are you? You're familiar with Node right node.js mm-hmm. and you're familiar with how it operates so for those who may not know node is a javascript backend programming language that compiles into running code and it's written in javascript and it is 
extremely open. So you can contribute to a module that you can then import and Jason can import my module and run it. It's a very open ecosystem and there are several modules that are importing into modules that you import that module. So there's a massive supply chain that you're not even fully aware of. What that was that goes, module called? <laughs> Event stream? Um, that goes from like you could import uh, like you could import MSP Geek, but we import six modules who then import six more modules. So you have like 18 modules and you just want yeah. a little bit of code. Like, yeah, if you if you make a base React app, I think you get 400 modules. It's it, it's a massive list um, of, of stuff. So coding and building applications that we use as MSPs is a complex, complicated thing that not many people want to dive into. Do you have any advice on how to yes. go upstream <clears throat> to see what my vendors may use? That isn't just I'm using product uh, X. Yeah, what the hell is the damn uh, tool that we used to do that? Uh, there is a tool we use. I can't remember the name of it because I don't dev these days. Uh, but there are multiple tools out there that will basically scan in, in the node case, your node modules file. Yeah. And in the Java case, it's uh, your POM. Uh, they will scan uh, the upstream modules and look for CVEs in them, right? Uh, but that's only as good as... Uh, as the CVE is being reported upstream, right? Like this specific case that you're hundred percent talking about is event stream, right? It was like some like four fifth, seventh party module. Yeah, there's one, Ray just shared one. That's, there's a ton of them. Uh, it was like a seventh party module that like a base uh, React app got and somebody, it basically it ended up abandoned on GitHub and somebody just registered the GitHub org and released a new release of it. And the release they did was so, this is like Stuxnet targeting. It was so targeted that basically they added code that if you were this one specific cryptocurrency like wallet site, it would do something different and suck away all your crypto wallets. Uh, and it was, I mean, this was like next level shit. Uh, you know, I, I you just have to be diligent, right? There's there's an, an entire world of uh, uh, of these sort of supply chain risks, and they're not they're not unique to Node, right? Like you know, it's yeah. I, I use I, Node I, because I think it's the easiest yeah. example to understand. Yeah, like I mean, a car is a good way. Like you know, BMW doesn't build the car. Like there's yeah. a thousand mini manufacturers that build the little you have the gear shifter knob and then yeah. someone builds the seats and then someone builds the leather for the seats and then yeah. BMW I, assembles it. That's that's the the supply chain is that I'm, what I'm I, referring to. I, I like to argue that these sorts of problems follow around like web developers because they don't actually they aren't actually like real software developers. So you can actually follow the chain of shitty modules like it, it like node is a new hot now it was Ruby before that before that it was PHP and before that it was probably Perl, right? So there's like a chain of shitty code that just follows the web developers like around. CGI bin. Yeah. Uh, at Those least then days. you had to know like C or something. Uh, well, uh, Perl but, used the CGI bin yeah, to, to process yeah, the code. Perl. It, the, yeah. There's, there's a, uh, there's, there's a lot of that that goes on and in, in the end, I think it's somewhat arrogant to say that you could not use those modules and you would have any less security issues if you implemented it yourself, right? So, you know, they say developing a product in a space that already exists is 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 making all the mistakes that all your predecessors made before you, right? So, you know, it took us a long time as an MSP and me personally to get past the like not invented here syndrome of the world. But the reality of it is, is that, I'm not much less likely to make some of the same mistakes. Now, that's not true because, like, I if, if like you ever mistakes. find SQL injectable code of mine, then you can shame me if, if it wasn't written in the like 1990s. Yeah, but uh, you also but, have like the experience missing. Yeah, that that caused mistakes to happen just because you don't have that experience in that area. So it's it, it can yeah. be not like malicious intent, not act you know yeah. just bad coding practice just experience and implementing something could uh, cause 100 to make a mistake that's already yeah. been resolved 
Yeah, and it's why I really like uh, I I you know one of the things I've given Connectwise like a raft to shift for is like the whole Connectwise SSO experience, right? It's like this is a solved problem by people that are way the hell smarter than you are, right? Why are we reinventing the wheel here? Uh, so it, it's you know I would lean on people to do due diligence in their vendors, uh, and but at the same time. Uh, don't write it all yourself because your vendors, as shitty as they are, they're probably going to do a better job than you are. Unless you're a software developer, in which case, ignore everything I just said. But only if you're good. Yeah, that's that's fun. Um, all right, so moving on to our final topic, and then I guess we'll take questions if you still have time. We're technically over time. five minutes. Um, how can MSPs prepare? for the the new landscape that's occurring because obviously we have microsoft is changing their setup to be from on-prem to fully on cloud like even exchange you can get on-prem but it's a monthly fee um the new the v next whatever they're calling it now um but like it's this is the new new how can msps how do you prepare personally how do you prepare your staff personally um to complicate to to resolve this complicated issue because you gotta you gotta train right, right? you gotta you gotta yeah. prepare people for what's going to happen before it happens right i mean we certainly let people tinker uh there there's a couple there's a couple of things to consider here that like one not everyone re learns the same right i i read i personally read a ton uh and and gain a lot out of i'm like the guy that like gets a new thing and sits down and reads the instruction manual while everyone's making fun of me right but it's like i know how to use 80 percent of the product whereas they only know how to use 20 percent of it uh it, it in the end it comes down to you you constantly have to be improving right you if you if you exist in this space you have to uh give your employees time so first of all, if you're an owner and you're not a one man shop and you have technicians under you and you aren't also learning at some point or another, you need to accept the fact that uh, you have to stop doing some amount of the technical stuff. Like I don't, I, it'll, I'll, I don't do help desk, right? I don't do like low level shit at our company because like the way they do things is completely different than the way I would do them. It doesn't mean I can't solve the problems, right? It just means I may not know the newest take you longer. like technical. Well, it's not even take me longer. It's just, I just don't know the best practice way You're of doing old, that. Jason. Right. I'm, I'm old. I'm, I'm 41. So I'm officially old. Uh, the, I am a huge, and I've said this already in this call, I am a gigantic proponent in the CTF format. Uh, and I think that as far as scaling up resources go, it is seriously the best thing that I'm, every MSP can do. And, and, you know, maybe on the security side, maybe it is, uh, maybe it is more traditional, uh, we'll call them either CTFs or cyber ranges. Like I'm talking about like hack the box, uh, try hack me, right. Those sorts of things. Like, they make you apply applicable skills to actually get it. Like some of the CTFs, like the ConnectWise CTF, you know, it's a little more gimmicky. Like some of the shit we're doing there isn't probably directly ap applicable to uh, MSP life. But, you know, the format is great because you you work through it. You know, you're solving problems. In, in solving those problems, you're doing a shit ton of research and you're and you're learning a new thing, right? So, uh, I would encourage a lot more use of that concept in the space. I actually think uh, here a free product idea for you. Uh, I actually think there's a space in our industry for like a try hack me or a hack the box specifically targeted at like say MSP skills, right? So you take some of the things like Kelvin did with the CTF and you, you literally just productize problems it, like here's the help desk certification that you get through by going through like essentially like a hack the box style uh thing uh and you solve all these problems and, and now you're help desk certified right and, and you've basically practically proven that you can actually work through them and solve them and you know i don't i don't give a fuck if you google the answer right like i uh, I occasionally teach college classes. I, my kids can use Google, right? Like if you, I, know, I, I can name in one hand the number of times I've been locked in a closet without internet access trying to solve some weird ass computer problem, right? Like Google is totally a resource you can use. 
Uh, but you have to be able to show you can solve new and challenging problems. So, I don't know. do you do CTFs and hack the box stuff internally? Oh, uh, yeah. I encourage my employees to do it. Uh, I just put three employees through John Strain's thing that uh, security thing that he did. Uh, I'll put several more through the second level of that. Uh, I, I'm doing this CTF alone, uh, but I have encouraged uh, our employees to uh, to do that, and I encourage them to do them. And I'm in the process of standing up in some internal resources, uh, some of which are based on some of the stuff Kelvin's done, but some of them are uh, based on our own stuff to try to you know do those sorts of things to try to bring people along. I mean, we lab, we do, we have uh, a ton of uh, lab resources available to our employees, and when they have time, which you know varies week by week, yeah. they're very much encouraged to tinker. So, let me ask you this question: What is the most difficult thing that you face as an MSP? What is your what is your most difficult challenge that you have to solve? <laughs> Well, I would say sales and marketing because we suck at it. Uh, but from a uh, uh, traditional stance, I mean, it, that's an answer that's going to be different for me as essentially a quasi business owner. Uh, right now, my challenge is finding good employees. Right? It's 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 hard. Uh, we we tend to hire, try to hire and skill up. Like we are almost 100 percent hiring on cultural fit these days and not skills because i figure skills are trainable but like if we don't like you it's not going to work uh uh it's that's probably the biggest challenge we're facing right now is is where to find good talent so you know i have a vested interest in trying to i teach college classes just to like make sure people are like learning relevant things and i I'm not going to lie. I cherry pick my best students out of class and I approach them about applying. So you're cheating the system and you're robbing us of good, valuable employees because you get the first pick of the litter. You go teach your own college classes. It's a smart move. I'm not going to lie. That's pretty smart. Like it's a, that's a next level move. Um, yeah, I'm teaching networking classes. So I, I get people that understand at least a little bit of networking. Yeah. It's, it's a, that, that is a difficult thing, you know, and I'm not going to tell the Mindy joke because it's, he's not here to make fun of. So I'll leave that to, to another time. But finding good employees is hard. Finding good, there, there, there's a two-stage step, right? It's, it's always, that's one of the most common problems that MSPs face, I would think. Um, you have the culture fit and then you have the technological fit. And you can find both or you can find one or the other. Like they all come in all kinds of packages and... Like there was even a discussion in one of the channels today about um, how do you evaluate technical skill, you know? And I think the general consensus is you have someone sit down and just have a conversation with them and play them through scenarios, right? Um, I don't do that at all. You don't. Oh. How, how, how do you how do you identify technical skill? So the last couple of rounds, we actually had an interview lab. They had to do a lab during the interview. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean instead of having someone have a conversation, then you, you just, you put them through a test instead of having yeah. a conversation about it, which is, it's the same result because at the end of the day, it is. you're like, okay, you have a network card that doesn't work. Yeah. What do you do? <laughs> I'll answer any questions I mean, you ask of me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I, 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 yeah. It's really, it's really tough, especially if you're hiring like entry level or tier one positions. Cause all these kids are coming out of high school, college, wherever the hell they're coming from. And they all literally have no experience. So you're looking at a bunch of really shitty resumes and trying to figure out which ones may work. And like, literally there are no, no clues uh, as to which ones may like, we get ones with like amazing resumes and you talk to them and they're fucking dumb as rocks. And then you get ones that like, the co-op office sends over and they're like, man, this kid, he just can't get an interview everywhere. He interviews really shitty everywhere he goes. And we have a conversation with him and we put him through like a technical, like a more technical interview. And he ends up being an amazing employee. It's, it's really hard uh, to the, the technical to, space. The individual yeah. personalities is so wide from, yeah. Cause you have those introverts who can't interview well, who don't do well in social situations until they're comfortable with what they do like 
you can ask them a question about TCP IP and they'll answer your question just like that because they're familiar with it, they're comfortable with yeah. it. Yeah. But going into a high stress situation like an interview where life or death for some of these individuals matters. Um, you know, they have debts to pay, they have bills yeah. to pay. That like it's it, it's a different situation than putting them on a phone with a client. Yeah. You and know, I have two employees. Them. Yeah, I've got two employees. They're really good employees. They fucking suck at certification sets. They just can't do it, right? So it's like I'm asking them to, to take these tests to to move their career along, and they're just they're 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 not good at it. And it doesn't make them good employees. They're just bad test takers, right? Like the the same sort of thing exists everywhere, right? Yeah. It, it's like you know, just because you can't be articulate in an interview, it doesn't mean that you're you're gonna be. Uh, it's not Matt. Uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a necessarily bad employee. And I, I, I think that's an unsolved problem. I think that uh, sorting through that stuff, uh, one A-R-Y-X-A asked if I if I had better luck uh, uh, cherry picking. And, you know, the one thing that, you know, the approach of teaching a class and finding somebody good has is my classes are very lab based and they're very problem solving based. So at the end of it, whether or not they interact in class, whether or not they, uh, they, they do things I've got, I've had 15 weeks of experience with this person to get to know a little bit about their personality and a whole hell of a lot about their problem solving skills. Right. So, you you know, it it basically gives me a 15 week interview of potential students. Um, I, I don't think there's enough, there's plenty of HR specialists. Like there's, you can't, we, it's we not can't an solve HR problem, problem that way. It's not an HR problem. It's an, it's just a it's like almost like a societal problem. Like you know, we send you a piece of paper that tells you how good we are, and you have to understand yeah. and read that. And that's that's our communication medium is a piece of paper that explains our skill set that hopefully matches what you're looking for. And then we have a conversation, and then you make a huge decision. Both sides, like the employee side joining to a company is a big decision and a company yeah. hiring an employee is a big decision. Like it, it most companies yeah. don't realize it, but it costs more money to hire new people than it does 100%. to promote people internally. Yep. Um, and, so, I mean, we try to do that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it, it's not a, just, you can't just throw more HR specialists or HR people at it, or even like talent firms. You can't just throw them at the yeah. problem. They're not going to solve it. It's not a it, recruiters are the worst. Yeah. They're literally only incentivized to like get you to hire that person. I mean, but to I, to Rexia point, like you know, not not every one of my employees is necessarily client facing, right? Like they, you know, they're they're not. I have employees that aren't they aren't awesome uh necessarily in front of clients i'm not always awesome in front of clients i if you can't tell i'm like opinionated and i could be an asshole right so like every once in a while i put my foot in my mouth right like but in in the in the end uh, i'm actually i mean i think i've been pretty good here tonight uh the uh but in in the end you know we need like a rubric to grade people on to, to put like, you know, to use like the EOS term, it's like right person, right seat, right? Like maybe I have the right person and they're just in the wrong seat. So like, I need this like sorting algorithm that can take in like a whole bunch of people, information on people, including shit that people don't necessarily want to give like disc assessments and basically match them with the spot they fit best in. And uh, I mean, someday we'll figure that out. And then like the next year we'll have Brondo. So yeah, I don't know. Um, it is what it is. True. But I mean, going back to that point where, you know, that person to be able to think through a situation and not freeze their lock up, it's a different scenario with you trying to troubleshoot a problem that's caused a client to be down and having to explain that to them and them having to sit in front of five or six people being grilled about technical knowledge because you like you as a technician explaining a client that they're down you have evidence reasoning and understanding to the situation where you don't always have that going into an interview yeah. Um, well, you don't have that yeah. relationship that generally you can rely on to pass information on. Like it, it's, it's a completely, I would say someone who freezes up, doesn't do well in an interview, doesn't necessarily equal them to be a yeah. bad client facing issue it, dealer with her. Well, and in the end I said, 
if I got a fucking critical issue out like that, dude, I send account management out, like leave my tech alone. Right. It's like, I'll get on the phone with these people. Like I've got a giant client and they'll call me. It's like, they're calling me every 20 minutes when there's an issue. Right. And it's like, dude, I can fucking solve the problem or I can talk to you. Like you pick one, but I can't do both at the same time. So, you know, in situations like that, where like maybe I've got like a P one issue or like a server had some sort of critical thing, or there's a ransom issue or something like that, where, you know, I've got one or more like really good techs on, on, hand i got account management out there just to get the client to leave the tech alone so they can do their damn job that that's one way to solve that problem i mean that's a that's a great way that's a great solution because account managers account manage right um and honestly yeah i got i got no additional thing to add that's good you should do that users <laughs> Um, so I think we're now at our Q and a portion, even though we've kind of just s moved into it. Um, so for Q and or A's, uh, if anyone has any questions, um, about anything, life, the birds and the bees, um, but we haven't said namaste new norm or what's the other one? I haven't said that at all. Why is there a drinking game? I mean, I'm on my second beer. Namaste. Mm-hmm. Is that like a term? Like I know new, oh, like it's the new tech, normal. It's a it's a tech bar thing. Yeah, new norm. That's it. Yeah, new norm. Namaste. What's the third one? Unprecedented. On, right? Unprecedented. That's it. Yeah. Like we're in the new norm, guys. You know, yeah. you got to back up. You got to secure. You got to MFA. New norm. Yeah. Got to deal with it. Um. It's uh. So yeah. Uh. If you could give a quick and dirty. Of why to avoid Kaseya, he'd appreciate the uh, King Tud would appreciate it. Uh, so before he answers this question, um, there's a lot of non-security reasons why Kaseya isn't exactly the best company to deal with. Their product may be great, but their contract right. habits aren't great. Their supportability and you. Uh, community interaction like interaction between individuals and some of their support staff or you know higher up uh has it always had the best of reputations um but i'll, I'll let jason answer from yeah i mean so like from a there's a litany of terrible terrible business reasons that you should avoid them uh there's again as it was pointed out there's some arguably legal uh contractual terms in a lot of states it's actually illegal to renew a contract for longer than the term it was originally signed for and they're definitely doing that oh, yeah. uh the the second i mean the real reason is is that you know you had this whole uh, this whole security incident, which was like that, dude, this was like a brown paper bag bug, right? Like it, it's the, the biggest shock to me, like looking at the flaming pile of horse shit that is VSA is that like no one had found that sooner. Uh, and the reality of it is rather than be transparent about it and talk about it, they like locked themselves in their hole and they sent fucking Mike Sanders out to, to sit on this cyber call to try to defend it when he has nothing to do with that. Like they, they just, the, the entire communications, the, the whole, what's it, Fred, the whole Fred thing where he's in these videos, it just, it rings hollow. And, and the reality of the situation is it's, it's funny because, uh, I spoke at IT Nation Secure. Me? You? Oh, your wife. Oh. <laughs> uh, I I spoke at uh, IT Nation Secure like just a handful of weeks before uh, before the Kaseya breach, and I literally called Kaseya out because of how shitty their uh, uh, vulnerability disclosure program was, and they they softened it like twenty percent. Like when they went to uh, after their breach, right? So it used to be like damn near hostile towards researchers. Like we do not pay bounties to bug bounty things. And it's like, now at least it says like, well, we appreciate your effort, blah, 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 blah. But, but if, if you look at it from a high level standpoint, right? You've got people that are willing to, you know, poke your product and send you details on how to exploit it and spend a bunch of their hard earned time to do that or, or their time to, to do that. And, this is literally a thing where you essentially only pay them when they 
bring you something that's actually actionable. And you've got a company that is like damn near hostile to those people, right? Like it, if Kaseya didn't write DIDV, DIV, yeah, DIDV, uh, that the Netherlands research group that found that a giant ass check, then holy shit. Like, I, I just don't know what to say. Wasn't there like not to throw gas on the fire, but wasn't there a bug discovered after that? And like the old portal, which was still available. That was super. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, you know, they had this whole thing where it's like, well, if you lock down this port, which should have never been open to the internet, then you're you're safe. And the reality of the situation was the way they had IS configured, you could actually get to that same portal using a separate web path inside of the agent, your, inside of the agent path, right? So, like, there wasn't, I'm not sure it was a different bug, but you could, like, you could totally log into the, like, tech level portal using the client, uh, client check-in port right so you know the clients check in on port i don't know it's like 8500 or whatever the hell it is you could hit like uh url colon 8500 slash like portal and get the full flipping portal there right and and so from a a high level standpoint as much as i throw shit at connectwise which is mostly because that's who i use uh it's at least bb.net the casavsa product appears to be mostly like classic ASP, right? So like it's like a level of shit below BB.net, and and so at some point or another, you have to consider that uh, the security practices that were in place when a- classic ASP was in commonly common use are just incompatible with the current security landscape. So securing that in a reasonable fashion, it's it's pushing rope. There there's literally no way to do that in a reasonable fashion. I have an ASP Classic book. Like yeah. it's, it was not called ASP Classic anymore, but it's no, yeah. how to ASP. <laughs> um, so yes, uh, I hope that does answer your question, uh, King Tud. Uh, I think most of the issues that have spurred most of this conversation to the, aside from the security implications, has been the IT glue acquisition and their. Uh, integration with how they're setting things up that's also caused a lot of issues and a lot of drama um so it it it's you i I, i'd fully bet the vendor um i'd say this about mine even though i'd pick mine over because i like but i would just do your best to feel comfortable with your vendor even if you do decide to leave if you can leave um so what do you what what do you think of the connectwise fortify program um, as a I, set of security products, yeah. I don't know about it. I don't know. I know very little about it, so I can't really speak intelligently to it. Uh, it what? Well, wait, hold on. Fortify, not the training shit. So Fortify yep. is what Sentinel, Sentinel one, one with you have Perch, the risk assessment with the shitty risk assessment tool. It's not uh, shitty. It's, it's shitty. It's a really good risk assessment tool. It's shitty. It is the. I wouldn't overpay for it. Who, who, who am I? Hold on. Who am I actually? Who are my friends there that I'm pissing off by saying that? Uh, it, it's yeah. I mean, it's not great. It's it's okay. It's it's just not. I don't know that. So, a lot, uh, yeah. considering the suite of tools that like Sentinel One, you know what that is. You know, Sentinel One's good. Uh, yeah, Sentinel One is the gold standard. The risk assessment is yeah. It's a good risk assessment if you don't have one. I don't know okay. of any good competing products that will allow you to do the similar things it does. Um, it is a hundred percent a sales tool. The risk assessment yeah. will allow you to better sell things. Um, I mean, we use Lifecycle Insights to do that. Full disclosure. I love Lifecycle Insights. They make a great product, and they're really responsive to my complaints about their UI and issues. I love them. Yeah. They released uh, a comparison tool for their analytics. Did you see that? They did. We play, we they play did. And I've got I've got at least two feature requests in their pipeline that are gonna make lives great. Uh really, because so, I've got like a thousand. <laughs> I yeah. had a call with the CTO going over my issues. I sent like this massive email, like, look, I love your product, it's fantastic. Here's what would make my life easier. Um I, so uh what I will tell the you there. Thing is they're very responsive to actual business use cases. So if you mm-hmm. can write them up in a, this is how I'm going to solve the actual business problem with that, then they tend to move on them. Uh, I mean, Sentinel One is like, they are the gold 
they're the gold standard in in the AV space. So like last year during Hack It, when I was playing fun AV defeat games, like uh, you know, on one end we've got Webroot. If anyone here is using Webroot, please don't. Uh, on, on the other end, you've got Sentinel One, right? You've got Defender is actually one of the harder ones to beat right now. Uh, Sophos, I've not really messed with it a whole ton. I think it's it, there's a whole like upper level of the pack that I think includes like the full Gravity okay. Zone version of Defender let me, plus Sophos. Let me Go. ask you these questions. That's yeah. on the same topic because I just I just looked up the product suite. Uh, first, I want you to answer if you're familiar with it. Second, I want you to yeah. identify the product it's actually using. Uh, Connectwise Fortify SAS. Uh, SAS. Uh, I presume that's Perch, maybe? Uh, popular class. It, it defines as checks for Azure AD and 365. Oh, yeah. I don't know what the fuck that is. Yeah. Uh, Fortify Assessment, we already covered that one. Uh, yeah. I think that one's pretty self explanatory. Uh, Fortify Protection. Yeah, that's got to be Sentinel One for sure. Scan client networks and operating environments for a holistic yeah. view of looming security risks. Yeah, that's got it. That's totally got to be Sentinel One, I presume. What about Fortify Endpoint? Uh, well, that could be Sentinel One. Ooh, <laughs> I don't know what the other one is. And what the fuck is the other one then? <laughs> uh, endpoints include laptop, desktops, mobile yeah. devices, servers, and even virtual environments. Okay, so that's uh, Sentinel One. Endpoint exclude includes a fully staffed twenty four seven SOC. Oh, that's Perch. Right. That's Perch with uh, Stratazen sprinkled in for fairy dust or whatever the hell they're calling themselves. Yeah. Right. Fortify Network. Yeah. I mean, I hope that's not the network probe because that's like fucking hot garbage. I, I have I no idea what so. that would include. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, data privacy law is another regulatory requirement to compliance with GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA. Yeah. More. I mean, why would you not just be using, like, honestly, the Microsoft data protection shit there? So there are cert to answer, Nightwolf, to answer your uh, operations manager's question. Uh, Sentinel-1, that product is an amazing. Fortify risk assessment will allow you to better explain to your clients and keep track of them in a decently usable format uh, and allow you to help sell additional tools that they may be lacking. Yeah, I personally, uh, perch is a good pro fills a niche, but it may not fill the niche you need. And it, and it may not be up when you need it. Uh, aside from that. Um, but perch is a great product. It's built by yeah. a, a lot of lovely people who may They're or may amazing. not have taken me to dinner at least once. Um, and I have not had the pleasure of skyline chili, but I, I per, purchase is, is a fantastic group of people it's built by a lot of intelligent individuals. And while there's some issues, probably, um, oh, connect wise, identify perch and stratism. They don't call it okay. out Sentinel one specifically. Yeah. Um, I, I would look into it if you don't have any other tools or you're uncomfortable with some of the other tool sets. Um, I would look the main tool sets that connect wise is utilizing for the fortify product suite is acceptable. Yeah, they're good. They're reasonably good tools. I mean, in the end, we have a, a whole vendor ecosystem right now that is attempting to sell you a solution to your problem. And, and honestly, nothing will be learning and making educated decisions over what goes into your stack and why. Like maybe you are only buying that tool because you don't understand the risk that you're trying to solve and when you actually understand the risk you realize that you either don't need a tool because it's not a big enough problem <clears throat> id agent or uh or you've already got some sort of tool or knowledge and you don't need it right so like don't don't buy shit just because it's shiny and you get sold 100 percent agree um night wolf i hope that answers your question um it is ConnectWise naming convention is garbage. Yeah. Uh, I will never not say it. Yep. Stop naming things verbs. They're really hard to Google. To, to even find out about your problem. Yeah. <laughs> not even to find information, just to find out about it. That, that's that's a bad thing. So, so Ray has a thing. Um, yeah. Can are you share there... questions that you had? Yeah. So I, I was looking to see if there were others. Uh, ConnectWise so, on. <laughs> on. Yeah, ConnectWise do. ConnectWise B. Uh, so 
the the types of questions I ask I ask vendors like you know what what does your vulnerability disclosure program look like right like how are you how are you handling uh, vulnerabilities coming in from third parties uh, what does uh, your security what do your security audits look like? Can you, you know, particularly, can you share any audit reports? Uh, I think that's a valid question to ask a lot of vendors. Uh, if they're small, right? So there's various levels you have to consider these. If they're small and like tangential, then maybe you don't need that, right? But like if they're if they're running agents, then I totally want to know, you know, what kind of third party review they're having of of that product to ensure that. It's not going to get pwned. Do you ever uh, ask for like those reports? Yeah, I, I mean, no. The reports are fucking stupid. I mean, it's I mean, like I, I so, agree with it's you. Like it's like SOC 2. It's a book worth of It's a, a book lot of, worth of shit that's basically they paid somebody a lot of money to produce a book worth of shit that say they're not terrible. And they're probably still terrible anyways, honestly. True. But now you could easily like score it on like a one pager like you don't need an entire book to explain yeah. that you included a library that may or may not be exposed to risk right um but i mean in many cases you can't even necessarily determine that right like if the say like they rate their agent in go like yeah, there's no way in hell you you can easily determine what like third party upstream libraries are using it's uh, i i don't know in the in the end you know, those are the sorts of questions I'm asking, right? Like I typically, if I was changing RMN tools again, I would not change RMN tools without a conversation with somebody high level in security there because the, the risk is huge. Uh, fortunately, we live in a world now where uh, I am tight enough with a lot of the MSP vendors that I can just frankly have those conversations with them. And a lot of other MSPs aren't necessarily in that boat. So I, I don't know how to solve that problem if you're not right like you just you you have to get comfortable uh with the fact that they're they're going to be responsive to you uh if you're uh if you find something uh in i don't know if if you find i i will say publicly and openly if if any of you find something with one of your vendors i know one of the guys earlier said it and the vendor is ignoring you like dude just ping me i'm a loud asshole and will allow to asshole them into submissions. So uh, you, that you is will have like, to verify the problem, though, right? You're not just going to. Yeah, I, I will it. totally verify yeah, the it's problem. It's fair warning. Yeah, yeah, I will correct. You're going to have to tell me what it is. If I can reproduce it, then I can allow to asshole as a service, uh, and we'll totally get no like eyes on the yes, no charge, uh, and totally get eyes on 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 the problem. And maybe you too can be allowed asshole. There's room for plenty of us. There is. Um... As someone who has matured in the managed service vendor space, uh, sometimes loud asshole is needed. Sometimes it's yep. not. You have to understand when it's. You it, got to read the room. You got to read the room. Um, you got to. And I, I, I love you, Jason, but most of the time, loud asshole isn't needed. Um, yeah. It, it does it can come to a point to where it is needed <laughs> and yeah feel free like I've, I've done it myself um i i have calmed down as i have more attention right like as is people as vendors have if started listening i i occasionally throw little tantrums mostly connect wise and but i think that most of the time uh they are they are well earned and and you know the most recent one i i threw was about you know like the perch data loss and you know in the end i got answers to questions that we would not have gotten answers to otherwise did you get an official answer i 100 percent. kyle totally answered he answered every single one of the four questions i posed to him yeah but i thought one I mean, had to go up and they were like i don't know <laughs> well i mean so the li i think it was a liability one they're political bullshit answers right but there's something right it's like you know well, his answer is yeah but i mean those I, questions those questions, there was no answer to that question. Like, what the hell? You think the vendor is going to tell you that they're going to give you communication to your client where they own liability? Yeah. What no. planet do you live on? There's right? no way in hell they're going to do no that. No one's right? going to do it. No one intelligent. 
enough uh, and wants to stay yeah. in business will do that. I should yeah, say. They're, they're not going to do that. But what I did make them say is that we would approach that on a case by case basis. Like I, I honestly think I consider I, I chalk that up in the win column, right? Because 100%. like, here's a problem that otherwise got very little attention that I brought to the community, made the community aware and made the vendor have really uncomfortable conversations about how the hell they're going to respond to that. And I consider that a win because if you don't do that, if you don't hold your vendors accountable and you, and you allow them to continuously have bad behavior, then they literally have no incentive to ever fix it and get better. So let me ask you this question. Oh, well, let me, okay, real quick, Sentinel one or Sophos intercept X. Uh, it, of those two, uh, I mean, we use bit defender, uh, although I'm evaluating Sentinel one, uh, I would, I would choose Sentinel one. It is again, during my AV testing, it is the hardest of them to defeat when you have all of the things on. Cool. Um, so that is one of the things that I think connect wise is on the, in like fully in the wind column, as far as their approach to community and their approach to the public and trying to build that better relationship, which didn't really exist beforehand publicly. Um, are, do you think any other vendors are, do you, what do you think of, of, of that statement? Do you think that's a, a factual statement? Do you think they're doing really good in that area? Um, and do you think any other vendors are, are doing that same thing or maybe have that issue? Yeah. I mean, I think they're, uh, they are, doing as well as they can right like doing well in that's that right. area is a business decision right like because they realize if they don't do well in that area then they're they're totally on their way out so uh i think business wise they're doing uh good and they and they they preach a lot of uh they they say the right things there uh but that being said they still will sell you web root i mean take that as you will true um and as Will said, so acknowledging problems and solving problems are two different things, but being able to have a candid conversation with those in power and those ability to solve the problems uh, yeah. is something that I've never experienced before in any aspect. There are a few occasions where certain aspects, like uh, like you, you, you won't sit down with a Microsoft CEO and have a candid conversation about their product line. You might have someone who is... Uh, designed and placed to have a candid conversation with, you know, asking specific questions that have been curated and already pre-answered. Um, but the, I, the, the fact that they're willing to sit in front of the community and be basically berated yeah, for fucking, what appears to be hours on end. It's, there's no, basically we fucking um, roast him. And yeah. uh, now, respectfully berating let's be honest now some you know we jab wow. here and there but it is it is considering how nasty some people can be it is generally respectful yeah. angry messages um and it is something that is first like shocked me personally from an exp from dealing with a business that has because generally like they'll throw someone in and be like deal with the community make it better and then they'll fire that guy later if he's not doing a good job because their product's garbage but they have buy-in from a lot of aspects of the individual company and that's that's it's 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 refreshing to see that someone wants to directly interact with their partner base and i'm not sure that the other vendors have quite understood the power that that can bring um and the because i mean let's be honest ConnectWise has been doing this for almost a year. And I, while if they don't permanently fix the problems, it is allowing people to vent their frustration and maybe not consider leaving. Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a valid strategy to try to like stave off while you can like basically come back and, you know, solve the fact that you basically ignored these products for years, just assuming they were the market leaders until one day they weren't. Uh, I, I mean, I, I enjoy, I very much enjoy our, the conversations with Jason. Uh, I think, man, he is like very uh, masochistic. I think he, he, I, I just, I don't understand how, I, I hate negative feedback. I mean, like it, it's, I mean, most people do, right? Like you hate, you hate being told you suck and holy shit, man. We tell that guy he sucks like every six weeks and he sits there and he takes it like a champ. And, uh, you know, he, 
he promises they'll get better, right? Like, but it, but it, at some point or another, they have to shit or get off the pot and they actually yeah, have to he, start making like his, improvements. One of his there. statements is, you know, I'm trying to make it better, but it's going to take time. Yeah, that's his. That's his like cornerstone statement. Is like, you know, I understand your problem. He to yeah. yell at someone to go fix it. Uh, yeah, transparency is key. Like Will, Will Hill just pointed out. That's Will. That's Will that's Hill? Sleepy Will. Oh, Sleepy Will. Yeah. Oh, it's 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 Sleepy Will. He should be okay. asleep by now, to be honest. Yeah, he gets <laughs> he gets like a thousand more complaint credits for for participating, right? Uh, it, so in in the end, being transparent about it buys a lot in my book right where uh whereas he points out it glue is the counter example of that and holy shit for as much crap as i give connect wise i i sit there and i throw fucking poop piles at the the it glue team and, and their vendor channel like all day because they just don't they they suck and they just don't seem to like be communicating at all about any of their issues and they they don't seem to have any roadmap or are they aren't communicating any roadmap uh, to fix them. So as a result, where you got somebody like Connectwise, who I largely think has problems and maybe sucks in some cases, they're very open about the fact that they're trying to fix them. Whereas IT Glue has a lot of problems and, and seem to suck in a lot of instances. They're it's radio silence for them. So one of these two products I'm leaving, and the other one I am trying to work with the vendor to fix. Right, and I think that says a lot. Like, I'll be off my last Kaseya product by the end of the year. All right, scenario for you. Webroot for your own protection or a thousand password reset that you have to hand do. <sighs> no automation. I think I'd take the password reset tickets. You don't want a blue screen? Your, your yeah. RDS server? Yeah, you don't want to accidentally flag all the Windows services. I mean, as can malicious. I just? <laughs> well, can I can I have to, can I have Microsoft Defender and two hundred password reset tickets? Because I mean, that no, sounds Defender's like a, a good product. No, it's a yes, it is. And you can't cheat. It, it it's all pre-installed. You but can't I get even it pull for it out. free. Like if the free product even, is better but you can't than the disable. one I have to pay <laughs> for. You can't even disable it. That's like, oh, that's trust me, I, man. I'm doing my I'm doing my macro shit for a hacker right now, and it has been the bane of my existence for three weeks. Like between Bitdefender on my uh, on my Dropbox and my work PC, and Defender on the various PCs, I have been playing whack a mole for weeks on like shitty things I'm doing in Word. So, it's terrible. Netwolf has another good question. Uh, 2000, not R2 server. 2008, excuse me. <sighs> uh, Bitdefender doesn't work. Um, any, uh, it's segmented from the internet. Yeah, it should be segmented from like everything. You should only be able to talk to local host. <laughs> um, while I concur, are you telling me you don't have any more on other west? I mean, I've run whatever yeah. the hell you can run on it. I mean, like, honestly, yeah. you've got some saving grace there in the fact that, like, literally no one is targeting fucking threats at 2K8 and on R2 these days, right? So it's like, I run FreeBSD on a lot of my personal shit. You know what? Even if it's not, like, the best operating system, who wouldn't write to exploits for that? Because I'm, like, one of seven users. Uh, it, I mean, so you, you got that shit going for you, right? But in, in the end, I bet uh, yeah, we're going to run on it. Probably. <laughs> Uh, but it, it, in the end, I think that, you know, put it in a VLAN that lives entirely by itself, like literally lock down every port you can to the damn thing. Definitely don't expose Samba to anything and uh, just try to get rid of it as quickly as possible. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. You know, it, if you, it, it can't get to the Internet. I mean, it may be able to get Internet through another machine. Like there's there's always yeah. a path if you can get through it, if it's not it, fully segmented. So. Don't let it talk to anything, right? Like, it, you know, if it gets it's owned, to to you know what? You know what probably. I care about? It's a server. If that box gets owned, first of all, I'll rename it to like this will probably get owned. That whatever the domain is, and yeah. then make sure it can't talk to anything else. So when it inevitably gets owned, at least they can't move laterally. Like, because that in the end, you can't protect that piece of shit. You just gotta make sure that when it gets owned, it's not gonna get anything else owned. I wonder if you could build like an. Run with me here. We're going to overcomplicate this issue. Uh, build a 2008 forest that's specifically only for this server that you have that with an RDS gateway <laughs> that's only allowed from internal than the internal network. So you have to RDP end because I'm assuming this server has to do something, right? This has to yeah. get this has got to connect to, and talk to something. And it's I'm probably assuming, running like Cognos 7 or something stupid like that. Yeah. And, uh, 
So you build its own mini infrastructure that you have to remote desktop into to get to. Can you, uh, can you, I can't, can a 2K8 forest uh, trust a 16 forest? I can't actually remember. Or is this going to be completely independent at this point? I mean, that's a consideration. Yeah, but just make it like. Oh, it's SQL 2K8. Is it C? That's a whole separate brand of terrible. He just said server 2000. Who has oh, a last night wolf? Okay, no er, er, legacy er, application Rixia. 2008 yeah. server. Like, why can't that legacy application run on like 2008 R2, or at least it's marginally better? It's server 08. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Ask Mendy, he could probably move to SBS for you. Hands down, he would happily do that. Um, what, yeah, but I mean, what if. Dude, I deal with clients that have that shit all the time. Like, literally, the only thing you can do is make sure it's not going to affect anything else when it gets owned. Yeah, build like its own. Like, if yeah. it's if it's that business critical and it does need access to the internet or at least a local infrastructure, like if you got to import data or something, yeah. you can always build its own mini infrastructure inside your yeah. business and just VLAN all the traffic to its own VLAN. Just don't um, domain join it. Like, there's no requirement to damn yeah. things domain join. Um. And also, accidentally drop the server when you're moving it. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, just accidentally pull three drives out and claim it had a double drive failure. Sorry, guys, we got to rebuild it from scratch. Yeah, on 2019. Yeah, I mean, just make it that Novell server they built a wall around at the University of North Carolina. I, I mean, I, there's there's no advice there. It's like, hey, I got this shitty thing that's terrible and there's no way to secure it. Can you tell me how to secure it? Don't fucking have a shitty thing that you can't secure. Like, like yeah. it, it, unfortunately, it, that it, doesn't it, work. <laughs> I, I, I realize I we I have, we have clients that have that shit all the time. Like I literally have a ticket sitting on my help desk right now that wants to uh, that that needs help because the self-signed certificate on their 16 year old cognos installation expired and now they want me to fucking fix it for them it's like no i mean i will because that's what you pay me to do but it's like holy fucking shit man 16 year old cognos like you you ran out the the wall on a 15 year old self-signed cert like that that you uh, i feel like you deserve an award on top of getting rid of it yeah um I believe that the advice is given is probably all you can do. Um, yeah. As much as I understand your plight, unfortunately, there's not much to do. Um, if it makes you feel better, I have a client that told me that they have Windows 95 running on business critical uh, science machines. Yeah act like actively like the software doesn't run on any newer os and uh, we, yeah i mean we run into that like there's and, still a bunch of atm machines out there that run like literally 95 and 98 yeah um but these are connected to the internet yeah it, uh, uh, so yeah i mean if things can't talk to it they can't own it right like they're you know, the reality is if you get local council gamed over anyways in almost all cases so right like the the if you lock down literally every port to the damn thing, uh, th then you you only have to worry about the one thing that needs to talk to it. And the question is whether or not that thing has security support. And if that thing doesn't have security support, then I, I just don't know what to tell you. You know, at some point or another, at some point or another, I think the correct answer is uh, to, you know, to a little bit to raise point, right? And I'm, so, if I told you this was a Fortune 100 company, Ray, I'm not sure how you would feel about that, the, my Cognos case. Uh, but at some point or another, you just have to make the cost of supporting it more expensive than the cost of them moving to another solution or they will never move to another solution. Yeah, like, I'll do that. I'll support that box. But that single box, because of the security risk it brings to me, is going to cost you $750 more a month. Like then, then now they're really considering what the ROI of like not moving to the new business platform looks like. Um, I mean, that's a good point. You know, if you're not having the retirement discussions, but you can still having that retirement discussion can still mean, yeah, we're not planning on moving anytime soon. Like that, what, what are you going to do then? Right. I mean, that beard that died. Hey, I resemble that. <laughs> Um, and that, 
So you it it becomes the point to where you if you support it, you have to charge more than the cost of migrating. Like that's that's the only true method to get them off of something they don't have, or they leave you. Yeah, that that's a good point. They leave you and. You know, you, you can't, so, you know, going on the conversations that are coming there now, you, you can't, if you back yourself into the corner where you're like, oh my God, the client's going to leave me, like I'm going to lose revenue, then you lose always a hundred percent of the time. Like you have to be prepared at some point or another, at some point or another, what is the reputational damage to your company when that box gets owned and it owns the rest of their entire network and they go out and tell all of their other friends and potentially other clients of yours that you're shitty and their entire network got owned under your control. Like the, the, the cost of doing that is, yeah, you just have to, it shit. It's complicated. Things aren't black and white. We live in a world of gray. Wise words. Uh, is there any additional questions? We are approaching on two hours of the live stream, so pew pew. Yeah, this is crazy. Um, I mean, you get you have you're, you're you're an intelligent people have questions. People have questions, and you may provide answers. Oh fuck, Clark's Clark's here. Mm -hmm. It's Matt. Matt works for me. So why is he asking questions? Why why are you using my time? <laughs> He paid he ask, Did he ask? He didn't ask a question. He's giving comments. Did he? And CGMD Clarkster. Go on his dime and ask questions and make statements. Um, uh, I I'm I'm pretty partial to it's not so. Are are we talking traditional bourbon? Because traditional bourbon, uh, I am likely. I think my favorite right now is and i'm holding it to fully traditional i really like it well shit that doesn't count either uh just say it because my answer is going to be 10 times better is it yeah. uh i uh, i'm really kind of a purist i like some of the uh old forester traditional stuff but i really like the angel's envy uh but i really these days prefer rise to bourbons so that's why it's hard for me um I consume the beverages. I don't really know what's in them. Uh, this is a a topic I'd like to learn more about, but I don't know enough. I, is Crown a bourbon? Uh, Crown. Is no, that's whiskey. Canadian whiskey. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I I don't even know if I've had bourbon to be honest. Like it's. Oh, you you will. Um, November November whatever that is. Uh, I I fully understand my lacking and knowledge and skill in this area um right we have a mission uh i am and yeah. i am i am a hundred percent understand as, as long as you're willing to put up with my ignorance about this um yeah so like i i barely prom i barely can understand like single malt double malt whiskeys yeah. like i've never had scotch um yeah, we're gonna we're gonna fix you. So the good thing is, is that I'm told that IC Nation Connect has a hangover room where they they will give you an IV to fix you. So we have a method to to make everything better. Fantastic. Um, but I mean, I I didn't go to a traditional college. Um, I didn't do any of that. Like I'm I'm never I haven't really been a heavy drinker. Like I, I've had a few recently. I've had beer just so I can get my talents level up because I know I'm going to IT Nation. Um. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to that, like I maybe have a couple of beers a month. Like uh, I have Crown and Coke. I have rum and Coke. I that's generally what I stick to if I do drink. Um, occasionally, I'll get a fantastically delicious fruity cocktail because those are um, delicious. Let's the not lie; that, they're, they're amazing. A, a, 100 percent like yeah uh so you're gonna find that the the old fashions at the rocks bar at the event venue are going to be life-changing for you i suspect you know i have had an old fat um i don't know i don't recall what was in it and it was relatively recently yeah so i can't tell you if it was a real old-fashioned or just one that they charged me a thousand dollars for so i'm i'm that guy well we ha we have our orders now ray um, also save cool. my wallet, we, please. 
No, I know, you'll. <laughs> I know this you, stuff you can, gets expensive. You can probably drink for free all weekend. I'm gonna go or all week. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say you sh- your booze beer bill should be damn near zero. I'm okay with buying drinks. I, 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 owe, I owe some drinks, so um, just buy your drinks that you owe. Then <laughs> lots of people owe you drinks too. That's probably fair. Um, but like, yeah, I, this is a subject that I'm a hundred percent ignorant in. And I under, like, I even like was Jason McGee was like talking about his, his bourbon. I'm like, you should send me one of those. Um, he could send me just a randomly brand and I'd be like, cool, this is a good, this is a good bourbon. And it'd be like a, a rye whiskey or it, yeah. if, as long as it's not clear. And I, I don't even know if could, I think bourbons are not clear. Right. Yeah, they correct. Yes, they're 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 no clear whiskeys uh, or bourbons. I mean, it, as far as my favorite goes, I'm really digging. I have a really good uh, Four Roses single barrel. I'm digging right now. So, um, but I, I look forward to my uh, education and learning of the more broader range of alcoholic beverages. That aren't just strawberry daiquiris and delicious pina coladas. That cool. Some pretty good. We done? I think we have to end. I think uh, I, there's no more questions. Um, and I think I'm going to press the end button because now it's do. Yeah. Uh, Declovia? Declovia? I don't. That's know. me. Oh, that's you. Yeah. A very unique sure. name. Yeah, it's my like randomly generated WoW name from years ago. I did one of those. All right, and on that note, oh. uh, I'm going to press the end stream button. Sounds so, great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Jason, for being a lovely participant um, and allowing us to have this fantastic conversation. Um, and I look forward to having another one in November. Who I don't know who's going to do it yet. This is going to be great. Um, but uh, I appreciate you guys for stopping and make Ray do it. Um, that, that's an option. There's there's so many options available. Yeah. Uh, I may make Ray do it. Actually, I I had an idea before Ray that may be slightly more intriguing. Okay. Um, but Ray's I've already talked to Ray about doing it. Uh, we just have should... You know what? You should make Jason McGee do it. Um. I, I was entertaining the idea of having a, uh, a product manager. Um, yeah. On, uh, I think that would be an entertainer. And on that it, note, I'm it, pressing the end yeah. button. Yeah, okay. <laughs>